at some juncture, uh, people are going to realize that this prospect of continually printing the money is going to lead to a significant increase in inflation. Uh, when that moment comes, it, um, it, it's, a, it's a moment where, um, where everything, where the world that you knew stops and a new world begins. Hi there, welcome to Stand Easy. Today I'm joined by Dr. William White, who is currently a senior fellow at the C.D. Howe Institute in Toronto, Canada. Until April of 2018, he was the chairman of the Economic and Development Review Committee at the OECD in Paris. Mr. White was also a member of the executive committee, which manages the Bank of International Settlements. He retired from the BIS in June of 2008. Mr. White began his professional career at the Bank of England, where he's an economist from 1969 to 72. Subsequently, he spent 22 years with the Bank of Canada. He was appointed advisor to the governor in 1984 and deputy governor at the Bank of Canada in September of 1988. Uh, Dr. Bill White has served around the world uh, looking at monetary policy um, and uh, attempting to uh, keep the ship of state afloat. Uh, he's got an amazing perspective, some fantastic uh, speeches that he's given, given uh, previously, and his writings are, are, are really worth while. Um, a student of history, and uh, I really wanted to speak with him to look at the complexity of the monetary system and what that means for national security uh, professionals. Um, so uh, yeah, really looking forward to talking to Bill White. Here he is. I suppose I'll, I'll open with um, trying to narrow down the focus of this talk. Um, you talk to a broad audience, and as you know, um, I'm coming at it from a little different angle. Um, and what I'm trying to bring to the national security community is what do you see as uh, the risks to the global system? And what do national security professionals um, not understand about what's, what's going on, the risks involved in the global monetary uh, system, uh, the global economy? And uh, what are we missing in our strategic risk assessments? Well, those are, uh, those are really, uh, really big questions. Um, as you know, one of the one of the things that I, I, I feel is underestimated is the possibility of things going wrong in a number of different systems at the same time. Um, I guess I've been worried about the economic system, the political system, um, the environmental system, the, the public health system. And I think if anything goes wrong in any one of those systems, uh, we have to be more cognizant of the likelihood that something is going to happen to disrupt the other systems. And it's funny, I was just thinking this morning, for example, um, thinking about problems in the, in the economic system and the buildup of debt, um, not just private sector debt, but I was thinking particularly of public sector debt. And the mantra for decades now seems to have been, you don't need to reduce uh, government debts during good times, so long as you can maintain access to refinance your debt, uh, that's good enough. And when you think about it, it's a totally different way from people used, how the people used to think about it, which was you, you built up your ammunition in good times, uh, so that when bad things happened, like wars, uh, you had the financial capacity to um, uh, finance these things. But now we're riding so much closer to the wind uh, that uh, on, on, on the fiscal side, that you could see the potential for problems coming down the line if certain shocks were to emerge. So I guess the, 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 the principal line that I've been pushing is, um, the thing that people don't really understand is that each one of these systems is in itself complex and, and, and prone to breakdown. Okay, we can't always assume the best. They are complex and are prone to breakdown, and they're all interrelated. So that if you get problems in one system, you should be starting to think about the possibility of problems elsewhere. So that, that I think is the, the, the principal sort of 
um, area where a lot of people don't just don't get it. With regards to uh, the economic and monetary policy, um, you know, how much ability do policymakers have right now to solve that problem to stave off uh, one of those four horsemen, as you mentioned, um, how bad is it really? And uh, what's the best histor historical analysis you have for looking at the current uh, time period? Well, I think, I think we're actually in a, in, in, we're not in a good place uh, on the economic and financial side. And there's very little room for maneuver uh, to get out of the bad place that we're in. And, and what I mean by that is that we have uh, very, very high levels of um, both private sector debt and public sector debt. And um, the numbers have been ratcheting up for, for, for years and years. Um, I think at the, at the beginning of the great financial crisis, the global debt ratio, that's the ratio of total debt to GDP, uh, was something like 280%. Um, prior to the pandemic, it had risen to 320%. And since the pandemic, it's gone to 360%. Now, these are numbers that are unprecedented, basically, historically. Uh, perhaps they may have been in some countries a bit higher during the Second World War. But uh, we're, we're, we're really flirting with very, very large numbers. And at a time when there, there hasn't been a war, but the international climate is becoming, you know, increasingly dangerous. So, so we have some problems on that front. And in part, I think the problem goes back to the use of monetary policy in um, really in, in a rather imprudent way, I think. And I've been saying this now for well over 20 years that every time there's a bit of a possibility, there's a slowdown in the economy, economy or the possibility of a slowdown, uh, the answer basically is lower interest rates and print the money. And essentially what is happening is that you're inducing private sector people to take on more debts because of course the, the interest rate on that debt is, is lower and it's more affordable. But as you get this buildup of debt, the economy becomes essentially more fragile. Um, so if you raise interest rates, for example, in an environment where people have got very high debt levels, um, you put a lot of people out of business, you know, and you, you may get a kind of tipping point in the economy where you tip into a deep recession, not just a little recession, because of the vulnerability to all of this, this debt. And in a certain sense, um, well, to finish, to finish that thought, so you have what I've referred to in the past as a debt trap. So you've got the central banks now, they've got these interest rates very low, and they know in their heart of hearts, and they're saying it increasingly, that they can't raise interest, they're caught in a trap because they can't raise interest rates because of the phenomenon I've just referred to. They're gonna put a lot of, you know, it could be very disruptive when all that debt is out there to raise interest rates, but they can't leave interest rates where they are, which is abnormally low. I've never seen anything like this. You know, the interest rates in real terms, you know, the interest rate minus the inflation rate, it has never been this low as far as, as, as I can remember or, or, or see in any of the textbooks. I mean, it's extraordinary. So they can't leave the interest rate where it is because it just induces still more people to take on still more debt. So for example, they're talking now about corporate debt. They're expecting a huge expansion of corporate debt in the United States in the third quarter because these interest rates are so low. So, so what are you gonna do? We have a problem. And in the fiscal side, it's, it's much the same because you might say, well, You've got a very big uh, fiscal debts of government debts have been rising very to, to very very high levels, uh, particularly during the pandemic. Uh, so we really ought to tighten up. But of course, tightening up in the current environment is likely to have the same kind of negative consequences. Um, so there's 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 a real issue here. There's a fragility on the financial side and the economic side that I don't think people are. Um, aware enough of. So it, there's an old joke I, I've often used, which is guy falls out of a 
story window. And he goes past the second floor and someone shouts out, how are you doing? And he says, so far, so good. And so the attitude is one of everything has been fine up until now. So we just sort of linearly extrapolate that it will continue to be fine. But that's not the way the world works. The world isn't linear like that. It's highly nonlinear, as my joke seeks to imply. Yeah. And we should we should be aware that we're 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 in a very sort of fragile state at the moment. And uh, I don't disagree with anything that you said uh, at all. Um, any cursory look at history shows that, that we're at an interesting time. My, my only issue is that it seems, and please correct me where I, where I go off here, is that um, to admit instability means to admit um, significant weakness in um, the United States uh, as the backer of the uh, global dollar hegemony um, and their empire. And I'm just wondering, um, on the one hand, we have all these instabilities, but then I look outside, um, risk of great power conflict hasn't been there for some time. It's been 75 years since Bretton Woods, 15 years since Nixon brilliantly came off the gold back standard. No issues so far. 08 crisis solved, not a problem. Now we're coming out of a pandemic. We've got vaccine rollouts. Things are looking good. Interest rates are all time lows. I can borrow to my heart's content and, and go into the stock market because it's booming as well. Um, and spend, spend and print is, um, has been, has been wonderful for everyone. Um, What's the problem with all these things? Well, the, the, the problem with all these things is, well, to start off with, um, I think you're sort of indirectly referring to a human tendency to denial, you know, that we, we see a problem and we have no solution. So the, 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 the standard human reaction is to deny that there's a problem, uh, which is not helpful because it just means you're taking one step more down that path that you really don't want to go down any any further. Um, there is, this is really, the siren call of, of uh, spend and uh, print is, uh, is, is very loud. And uh, as I say, a lot of people would like to believe it uh, because it's obviously, uh, it seems like an easy and a painless way out. And I guess it's human nature to sort of say, well, if there is such a thing, let's go for it. Um, unfortunately, there, there's um, a number of plausible arguments that people are using to support the spend in print. I mean, one of them is, maybe you sort of alluded to it, Japan has been doing this big time for ages and ages and nothing has gone wrong so far. Um, there's a whole new school um, of thinking, which is called modern monetary theory, uh, which basically says you can spend and print and there is no problem until inflation emerges. And when that happens, we know how to deal with it. So, and the third thing I suppose is, is that what the central banks have been doing and what the governments have been doing over the course of the last 20 years although they don't talk about it in terms of modern monetary theory, uh, the bottom line has been that government deficits have gone way up, government debt has gone way up, and at the same time, the financing provided by the central banks has gone way up. So there's a certain tendency to say, but look, at, we've done this for the last 20 years, no problem. So why don't we just keep on doing it? And I guess my I would make a sort of a fundamental philosophical point that people are, as I said, sort of linearly extrapolating because they think the system that they're dealing with is a system in which it is possible to do that. But the fundamental error is that the economic, political, and social system isn't simple. It is complex and it is constantly adaptive. And what we know from the study of complex adaptive systems is that they all break down in the end um, because of stresses that are put on them that are inadequately recognized. And it seems to me that this is the kind of, it ought to be the broad sort of lesson than, that one takes from history and from the history of economic thought. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not the conclusion that people are drawing. They're saying, so far, so good. Let's continue down the same path.
And I'm saying it's more dangerous than you realize. If, if the electorate and politicians and central bankers are unwilling to take the tough medicine now, what does the other path look like with a continued spend and print? What, what does that do to the political order and, and, and social order, both domestically and abroad? In your opinion? Well, I think if we continue down the same path, my worry would be that at some juncture, and I'm sorry, I can't tell you at what point, I, I actually thought it would occur long before this, but it hasn't. At some juncture, uh, people are going to realize that this prospect of continually printing the money is going to lead to a significant increase in inflation. And then you will find, and we have seen this many, many times in history, then there will be a kind of flight from the currency. Uh, perhaps we're seeing a bit of that already in the rise of Bitcoin and all this other stuff. Um, the continued willingness of people to buy houses really is a financial investment that there's an underlying concern that this might not end happily in the kind of fiat currency world that we have, that spend and print will eventually wind up in significant inflation. Um, and as I say, historically, uh, once that moment comes, you know, it's a bit like hitting the, hitting the ground in my joke. Uh, when that moment comes, it, um, it, it's, a, it's a moment where, um, where everything, where the world that you knew stops and a new world begins. And we've seen the, 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 the movement from actually a deflationary environment to a hyperinflationary environment in Latin America on many, many occasions. And to suggest, well, it couldn't happen to us here because somehow we're different uh, strikes me as, um, possibly racist, but uh, certainly um, uh, certainly arrogant, um, because bad things can happen to uh, all sorts of people when they let the stresses in their systems build up to intolerable levels. Now, with, with the US dollar at the, the center of the system, um, I'm only partially familiar with, with Trippin's dilemma. How does that work out for the U.S.? Is the, is the West going to be, quote unquote, OK until the rest of the system, um, the rest of the monetary system says enough is enough? Or is this both external and internal pressures with the social inequality um, due to the access to capital that uh, the, those with assets can, can continue, continue to rise uh, in wealth? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a very good question. And of course, there's... Uh... I mean, going back to Triffin, he, he basically pointed out that um, um, the international, this was in the middle 1960s, that the dollar-based international financial system was fundamentally unstable and that it would collapse. And I repeat, he said that in 1966, I think, and here we are in 2021. But there are sort of growing concerns about the US dollar um, you know, the, 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 the U.S. now is far less important in terms of overall global production than it was at the time of, um, you know, 1972, at the, the end of Bretton Woods, when we got a, a totally dollar-based system. Uh, the U.S. is much smaller now than it was before. Um, there's a lot of animosity that's been generated uh, through the U.S. using the dollar as an instrument of um, geopolitical influence. Um, people trying to think of alternative ways to do things. Uh, the Russians, the Chinese, others already sort of moving out of dollars and their reserves and into gold, other things. Um, so we're, we're, it's obvious that the dollar-based system is not over yet. Uh, the fact that the fact that so many people are, are locked into it, um, that everything is still predominantly denominated in U.S. dollars, gives the system a, an inherent resilience. But um, the question at issue, as with the domestic stuff I was talking about before, is how long can this continue? 
So I don't think with respect to the dollar that there's going to be a, a massive dollar crash. But I think there will be a gradual eating away at the hegemony of the US dollar. And that uh, in the fullness of time, you will see um, more diversification. Um, it depends in part, of course, on what other people do. Because if you say, I don't want to use the dollar, then the question is, well, what are you going to use? And um, the euro, I think, a big step was taken in Europe, you know, when the Europeans decided to set up this um, recovery fund. And they've actually allowed uh, the European Union, sort of as the European Union, to issue bonds that are backed jointly and collectively, okay, to the tune of, I think, 800 billion euros. This is a big deal in the sense that it is now setting the scene for a, a larger euro-backed, um, sorry, a euro-backed debt, debt that's backed by the whole community, not just by individual nation states. And that has got the potential to um, be a rival for the dollar. But again, over time and assuming that the politics of the EU continue to move in the, in the direction of stronger union as opposed to weaker union. And China, well, China is a, something all to itself, but they, they're obviously interested over time in the renminbi having a more important international role. It's interesting that you bring up Europe um, only in, in strategic studies, looking at Europe um, and the underinvestment in security um, and uh, with their underinvestment has come the American requirement to guarantee uh, NATO and, and European security. Um, you, you talk to some national security experts and even some um, financial types and they say the, the Europe um, is, is, is stuck in, in many regards. Um, with that complex adaptive system, how would you see that playing out between negotiations on, on security and, and monetary policy? I can't see the, the US um, being thrilled with, with uh, Europe asserting itself uh, you know, on, a, on a more monetary front. Well, I've not been following this carefully, but the impression that I get is the Europeans have really started to wake up to the fact uh, that they need to play a bigger role on the security front and on the military front. Uh, the recognition, I think, under the Trump administration, uh, Angela Merkel, I think, gave a, a very famous speech a number of years ago, in which she said, um, this is a bit of a wake-up call. Um, and I think they're seeing more and more um, that they really do have to depend upon themselves. Uh, now, I'm not talking solely, solely, but that they have got a greater responsibility than they've undertaken so far to look after their own security. And um, I guess I'm hoping that uh, they will continue to do even more on that front. But again, going back almost to the beginning of this conversation, it raises the issue of where will the resources come from uh, to do uh, the things that need to be done. Uh, so you can talk on the one hand uh, the need for, um, in many countries, better social security programs, um, the need for uh, more military spending, um, and the list sort of could go on and on. And then the question is, where will the resources come from to, to deal with that? And um, uh, I think in many countries, uh, people will have to accept the fact, and this will be perhaps harder in the United States than anywhere else, that the, the swing towards market-based power and market-based control and away from the influence of the state, that that has really gone too far. And that in many places, the state will have to reassert itself uh, and that will cost money, and that means taxes will have to be higher. And uh, if people want government to produce the services that they desire, that in the longer run they'll have to pay for it, 
that the idea that you can just print the money, um, there's a certain room for maneuver there, but that room for maneuver is getting, is getting uh, increasingly um, uh, restricted. And that uh, something I think more fundamental will have to be done. But you can see in the, in the, in the public mood in most cases, uh, there seems to be um, a willingness, albeit grudging, uh, to accept that. Um, and I hope that there will be a continued move in that direction. Um, because to proceed in the way that we have been, as, as I suggested to you before, I think will lead to some very bad consequences. In, in one of your recent papers um, and, and talks, you, you brought up sacrifice um, and uh, political options narrowing. How do you see sacrifice playing out? Is it, is it simply taxes? Or are we talking about something more serious? Um, and as far as political options, how do we get, uh, oh, this is, how do we get honesty out of the, the political class about the, the, serious, uh, the seriousness of the situation? That is an enormously difficult question to answer. Uh, you may recall um, uh, Jean-Pierre, uh, Jean who was the, the previously the president of the, uh, of the commission. Um, and he said, um, of course we, you know, he's a politician. He said, of course we know what to do. What we don't know is how to get elected after we do it. And so in a, in a fundamental way, you know, this is the, you remember the old line, people get the governments that they deserve, that if the people are going to be very, very short sighted and uh, will only elect people that tell them they can have everything that they want and they can have it now, uh, then they will get the very opposite of what they, what they wanted. So the problem really is with the people. And that's the, 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 the question that I've sort of wrestled with myself, although I'm not a political scientist, is how do you get people, ordinary people, to start thinking longer term and to start recognizing that there are no simple answers and that sometimes hard decisions have to be taken, mistakes will be made, don't throw the rascals out because they've made a mistake because everybody's gonna make a mistake when you're trying to run a complex adaptive system. So how do you almost in a sense, get people to behave in ways that is not, that are inconsistent with their nature? And th there's a lot of stuff going on. I mean, on the corporate side in particular, you know, starting to think about sustainability, climate sustainability, and that the fundamental problem is we're, we're, not, we're not managing for the long term. You know, there's something very similar, okay? Like with the electorate, they should be thinking about environment and what's going to happen 20 or 30 years down the road, but they're throwing the politicians out after four years because they're not producing the goods up front. But very similar to a corporation saying, I can't afford to think about the longer term because I've got to meet next quarter's profit projections. It's the same kind of stuff. But in the corporate world, one does seem to see the beginnings of a major change in attitude on the part of the, of the companies, you know, and the management starting to understand that, uh, for example, you know, that share buybacks, if they come at the expense of investment, basically at the end of the day, leaves you with a, sh with a shadow corporation, you know, that you, you, you've depleted all your investment, the real resources are gone. All you're left with is a bunch of debt that you can't service adequately. You know, corporations are understanding increasingly, look at that, that's not the, that's not the route to go if we wanna be here 10 years down the line. Well, maybe you can get the ordinary people to think the same way. The, the worry of course is that if you can't, okay, then as the problems start to build up, and this, of course, is a worry that personally I would have. As the problems start to build up and the ordinary people basically say, um, this is too hard for me. We need, we need a, strong, a strong guy you know, to sort this all out. 
and then you get this swing to basically autocracy. And we've seen something like that. I mean, with the populist movements in many countries where there's the idea that they, they, they want somebody to be in charge, to sort this all out and thinking that it will be in their best interests to, to support such a person. When in actual fact, uh, that person, I mean, what history teaches us about autocrats, what is it, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts? Absolutely. That you're, you're going to go down a path that will not be in your best longer term interest. So but it, talking about this stuff, I mean, it, it, honestly, I mean, this is all in, you know, Plato's Republic. I mean, this goes back 3000 years. And the, the issues, the issues stay essentially the same. How do you how do you get people to to think longer term? Um, and we can talk, you know, education, but um, and a lot of people a lot of people do instead of saying, listen, uh, ordinary people can understand can understand this stuff. It's not that complicated. Uh, yeah, you, these are not words of fourteen syllables. Um, uh, so go for it and trust in their common sense. Um, and I think we, we have to try to do that. But um, the real worry is that it might be inadequate because there's so many other people out there saying, oh, no, there's a simpler way. Just follow me and I'll, I'll show you what it is. It's scary. Yeah. With, with all the complexities rising, it seems, uh, geopolitically, strategically, uh, domestically within within almost every country's uh, domestic politics. We, we've seen it in the U.S., obviously, and we're seeing some of that play out in Canada and, and, and Europe um, and elsewhere. Um, monetary issues, economic. Where where are we not looking, in your opinion? Um, you, you track all, all sorts of, of, of complexities um, from your angle and your student of history uh, sitting at the Bank of International Settlements as well. What are we not paying attention, attention to that you think is something that, uh, that could uh, further uh, complicate uh, our current affairs? Well, one of the things that does concern me is that it's not just that we're sort of on a bad path with respect to the economy and the financial obligations that people have taken out. But there's a lot of reasons to believe it's gonna get worse. Um, <clears throat> what I mean by that, and, and I, I think there's a lot of reasons to believe that growth going forward will, <clears throat> regardless of what gets done in terms of the demand side, you know, monetary policy and fiscal policy, that the real growth in the economy, the global economy will be constrained. And there's a lot of reasons to believe uh, that might happen. Um, one of them is the lingering effects of the pandemic. Um, people are gonna be fearful for a long period of time uh, about getting sick and going out shopping and whatever. Um, there's gonna be a lot of scarring, I think. I think we're, we're seeing it already, the number of people that aren't coming back to work. You know, it's a, a, a funny thing at the moment, right? In, in the States, they're saying, I can't remember the number, that employment is six or eight million below where it was prior to the pandemic. And yet there's vacancy signs everywhere. Same in Canada. You know, just walk down the street and there's signs, every, particularly in the restaurant trade, you know. Um, so something, something has happened there. People have decided that they don't, uh, they don't want those kinds of jobs, uh, that they have to be better compensated or that uh, they'd sooner stay at home and look after their children. You know, they, something's going on there in terms of scarring. And we know from history that um, downturns always leave scars. Uh, I think the catchphrase is they're hysteritic. You know, that the, the, the effects go on for a long time. And I think there are grounds for believing that the pandemic may leave even more scars than most of these downturns. Um, another thing that's of concern, of course, is the deglobalization uh, and um, the recognition that efficiency isn't everything. So, you know, we, we've had a lot of growth because of the search for efficiency, better ways of doing things. But of course, Think global supply chains, right? 
now we're starting to realize semiconductors, et cetera, et cetera, that when you have the complexity of the production process, all you need is for one little pin not to be there and nothing happens, you know? So there's cars, thousands of them lined up in, on lots waiting for, you know, waiting for, for semiconductors. And yeah. So that's another aspect of it. Uh, the demographics um, are going into reverse so that we had the baby boomers and all the Chinese labor by proxy, you know, coming into the world trading system. All of this is going into reverse. The baby boomers are gone. Uh, Chinese working age population is already falling. Same thing in Korea and, and Japan. Um, then, of course, you got the environment. And that's going to be costly. So whether you think in terms of we're going to mitigate climate change, that's going to be costly. It's going to take a lot of investments, wind turbines, solar, you know, changing the cars from petrol driven to all of that's going to is going to be expensive. Um, and if you have to adapt to a warmer climate, you know, we're going to build a wall around Manhattan. You know, all of this is investment that might otherwise have been used for productive things. Now it won't be. So there's a lot of forces that seem to me to be sort of slowing growth down going forward. And I guess the big the big worry will be, at least my big worry, is that the central banks now, particularly the Fed, have sort of switched their focus from price stability to full employment and growth, okay? But if their emphasis on we must have more growth comes at a time when all those forces that I've just described are saying you can't have what you want, then the upshot will be inflation, which is disruptive in and of itself. Um, so there's, that's, that's something that I, I think needs more emphasis. So there, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of things out there that people aren't getting that I think they should get, and um, but I guess the most most fundamental one is the one that we talked about before, which is it's not a simple linear system that is easily understandable and controllable. Yeah, it's a complex adaptive system that is not controllable. And it's not understand, not fully understandable, and therefore it's not controllable. So, um, if we're working on the basis of these really fundamental false assumptions, uh, you wouldn't be at all surprised to find that you're going to wind up someplace other than where you wanted to be. You said your your, your greatest one of your greatest fears, uh, on top of many that you've articulated, is that uh, this this go this goes on that we will avoid the pain. Um, is, it, is this the crack up boom? Um, and why should we be so scared of inflation? What, what does that do to a domestic, uh, domestic population? Why is inflation such a, such a, a tax on, on society? Well, to be, to be honest, um, in the current circumstances, if you could get a moderate degree of inflation, and somehow, and this is a big somehow, somehow keep the interest rates down, okay, a moderate rate of inflation and keep the interest rates down. That might be one of the easiest ways, the most satisfactory way of dealing with the many problems that we've got. So that because the inflation's going up and, and, and the, the, as the interest rates are being kept down, the real cost of servicing the debt becomes less and less. Or to put it another way, there's a kind of inf implicit inflation tax that everybody's paying through higher prices, but it's sort of relatively moderate and it's, it's, it's what's the word? We can adjust to that, it's doable. That might be the best way out. And to be honest, uh, that's exactly what happened at the end of World War II, you know, where the governments in particular had these great big debts. And what they did was they, they entered into a kind of pact, whether explicit or implicit, 
uh, with the central banks to keep interest rates down, to, to try to generate inflation, but to keep the interest rates down. And, um, and that's precisely how they got rid of the debt problem at the end of World War II. Now the question, and if you could do it again, you know, it wouldn't be so shabby. Uh, the question is whether you could do it again, um, because that was a world in which it was easy. You had capital controls, okay? Uh, you had controls over the banks about the interest rates that they could they could charge. Um, I'm not so sure it would be easy to do that these days where, you know, capital mobility is so great, you know, you can move from one country to another, you know, quite easily. Uh, I wouldn't say cheaply because uh, that, that, that's a problem in itself, but you, it, it, it's certainly possible to move large sums of money to other currencies in ways that it was not possible in the post-war period. Um, the second issue, of, as I said, moderate inflation. Okay? It's, you know, three, four percent per annum, not a big deal. Okay? There's, there's no evidence really that inflation at that level is going to cause any serious problems of misallocation of resources or, you know. Um, but the question is, with all the debt out there and all the fears going forward of print and spend, spend and print, whether you could keep those inflationary expectations under control. And that's what would worry me. Um, I think the, gov the governments, now the, the, I'm not really competent to judge in this area, but it, it, it wouldn't surprise me if governments made an effort to go down that particular route. And in a sense, as you sort of look what they've been doing, um, it's not inconsistent with them actually trying to follow that path, you know, get the inflation rate up, everybody's saying that, even more than the target, virtually everybody's saying that, but keep the interest rates down. Um, so it may well be that that's the path that they'll try to go and it might even work, but if it doesn't work, um, it's just sort of a shame in a way, I, I look upon it as a big gamble and it's a shame that we're in a situation where people might have to play that particular game, you know, gamble in that particular way. But that's sort of where we are. And I'm not sure that I would see at this point a, a better alternative. Um, one of the things that I think people should be putting a lot more emphasis on is explicit um, procedures for debt restructuring. So that um, one might say a lot of debts, you'd simply say you'd rewrite them so that they would become, um, well, one, one popular suggestion for corporations is uh, people that hold corporate debt, a good chunk of it would get turned into equity. So the corporation would no longer have the obligation of paying the interest but the person who now held the equity would get a, a, a stake in the profits if profits there were. You know? So the, the difficulty at the moment is that, um, and the G30, the BIS, the OECD, the IMF, uh, they've all drawn attention to this, is that our sort of judicial and administrative procedures for debt restructuring are in many countries inadequate. And so when people might sort of sort of go, go to the typical procedures and sort of say, I'm gonna blow the whistle on this particular zombie company, they're not inclined to do so because they know it'll take them years before the whole thing gets settled. So they, like Mr. McCauver, they, 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 you know, David Copperfield, they've got a tendency to to hope that something will just turn up, you know, they'll gamble for resurrection, but in not putting these, in not dealing with the debt problem and the existence of these zombie companies, of course, they're, they're just contributing to making the situation just a little bit worse. And when it comes to sovereigns, you know, the, I think the IMF said 
something like 40 or 50 percent of all low-income countries are already in debt distress. You know, they're having real difficulty in paying the interest on their debt. And it would be better in most of those cases if that debt were restructured and, and, and done early. But this is not happening. And in large part, well, there's many, many reasons for it, but one chunk of it is because there's no principles that have been widely accepted, um, um, no criteria for when it is appropriate to do a restructuring and what that restructuring might look like. There's nothing there in terms of principles. And so people don't do it. So there's a lot of practical, that, that would be an alternative way, a kind of total reset as it were on the debt front that would be very helpful. But um, there's not much inclination to do it. You know, you, you hear people talk about debt jubilees, okay? going back to biblical times. But the thing about the debt jubilee was that the guy, the guy who owned all the assets, you know, who, who had, to whom everybody else was indebted was the king and a few of his cronies who were immeasurably rich compared to everybody else, okay? So when they gave us sort of a debt holiday, um, nobody really got hurt. Do you know what I mean? Whereas today, if you were to do something like that, a lot of the debt that would get written off would be in your pension and mine. And needless to say, ordinary people, and I don't know whether they're ordinary or not, don't much like that thought. But the reality, of course, is that if the debt level, if the debt that they've got is actually not um, sustainable over time, in some fundamental sense, the money's already gone. The only thing that we're fighting over now is who's going to put it on their books. You mentioned a period of time um, post Second World War that where they deployed tactics like um, we're, we're seeing right now. What I struggle with is um, there was an acceptance from the population uh, post war because they'd already sacrificed so much. And it looks like for most in the West, there's been very little sacrifice. Um, and uh, the pain of inflation will now be felt. What's the best period of time um, that, that you look at the complexity within the global system? Um, I, I'm sometimes drawn uh, to the, the Guns of August from Barbara Tuckman and um, Lords of Finance, but it seems that um, those two books talk on different planes and it's almost where national security uh, experts and uh, monetary experts sort of talk past each other, even though they're, they're talking about some of the same things. Um, how do you look at these two, two interplays and what period of time do you, do you uh, try and refer to and, and help broaden uh, your perspective on the current uh, situation we're facing? How, how much time will it take to sort of convince people of the need for sort of fundamental change? Mm -hmm. Is that is that the question? Yeah, I suppose I, I might have danced around it there. Yeah, I again the answer is I'm I'm not sure, but one of the things that I I think you you did sort of re refer to was the the tendency of people to talk past each other, mm. and um, th this is something that I think again it goes back to my you know fundamental insight about these are complex systems military, health, environmental, economic, financial, and each one is nested within all the others. And what we do need is a much more sort of multidisciplinary approach to look at all of these issues, uh, almost like panels of people from different areas saying, here's a problem I have in my system, and here's what I propose to do to fix it. And then to have the people that represent all the other systems be in a position to sort of say, well, you could do that. But if you did do that, you're going to destabilize my system in the following way. Um, or conversely, you know, if you did that, that would help me in my system in the following way. Uh, I think we need much more of that than we're, we're getting. Uh, the politicians, in a way, ought to be doing it. But one of the problems, as, as you know, 
and I think this is still continuing, is that we, we now have a kind of political class in many countries. Uh, and I've just been back to Canada for the last few years, so I'm not sure that this applies to Canada, but it certainly used to, where the politicians are basically people who started off as politicians, you know, as parliamentary aides and stuff like that, and basically don't know anything but that, you know? So somewhere along the line, we need to get a sort of more, as I say, multidisciplinary approach to this. I just came back from, from the UK and, and one of the things that struck me was they were talking about the pandemic with the constant references to, we're just following the science. Mm. And I thought this was just fundamentally wrong because the science on one hand tells you about reproduction rates and et cetera, et cetera. And I guess the science could in principle, but not in practice, tell you how particular forms of lockdown will slow the reproduction rate uh, down to levels that you want. But what doesn't get taken into account when you say we're just following the science is all of the other side effects of lockdowns. So mental health, social order, political mistrust, vaccinations that didn't get given, breast cancer tests that didn't get taken, uh, heart murmurs that people didn't go to emergency for, you know, education that didn't happen, you know, kids leaving, basically leaving the educational process that'll haunt us for 30 years. None of this stuff is science. It's to do with the social sciences and humanities. And even the way I'm sure that when they were following the policies that they, I'm not sure, but I hope that when they were following these policies that involved these big trade-offs between the science on the one hand and the social sciences and the humanities on the other, that they were you know, all talking about this stuff. But to put it to the public in this unidimensional way is not helpful you know? because in these complex systems, there are no simple answers, there are trade-offs, and people have to become increasingly aware of the fact that there is no free lunch, and that if you're gonna get more of A, very frequently, you're gonna get less of B, not always, right? Because there's low-hanging fruit sometimes where you say, this is a win-win for everybody. But for a lot of policies, what the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. And the more common understanding we have of that reality, the, the quicker we'll get a buy-in to doing some of the stuff that is sort of unpalatable. You know this line, I can't remember whether I've, I've used it with you before, it's from John Kenneth Galbraith. And he was talking, thinking about Britain. Rab Butler, who was deputy prime minister, I think, under Wilson. No, I can't remember. But anyway, he, his autobiography was called Politics, the Art of the Possible. And John Gilbray said, politics is not the art of the possible. It is choosing between the unpalatable and the disastrous. And he was picking up on the fact that if you leave a problem to fester long enough, those are the only choices left to you, you know, between the unpalatable and the disastrous. And the real trick as to how do you convince everybody that the unpalatable is better than the alternative? That's the hard part. Yeah. And I don't think I have any easy answer for that. Well, so we'll prepare for broccoli. Um, <laughs> I, I think that that's a, a, a great place to probably leave it. Um, before I do, I've got uh, two final uh, points. Um, one is um, if there was a book uh, that you'd recommend to national security professionals uh, or others right now, what would it be? You know, this is a, it's funny that you should say this and I'm gonna recommend a book that it may be impossible for you to get. I hope not, that there's a reproduction out there. But I was just, I just turned to it the other day. Um, I found this book on a bookshelf where they'd purchased by the yard in a hotel in uh, Argentina. <laughs> and the book is called Recovery, The Second Effort. 
and it's written by Sir Arthur Salter. And Sir Arthur was the British Sherpa, basically the finance Sherpa in the interwar period or for much of the interwar period. So he wrote this book in 1931 and then had a second go in 1933. And it is extraordinary how prescient this book is. And even to the point where he starts off in his introduction, without using the words, it's a complex adaptive system. All of these things are going on. And if you try to treat any one of these problems alone, you'll wind up in trouble. This is 1931, okay? And he takes you through all of the different things that were happening in the interwar period, most of which had to do with keeping the peace. Okay, the Locarno Pact and the Kellogg Pact and all that kind of stuff. But the economics of it is just an absolute constant theme underneath it all. And he makes the point over and over that when you start thinking about individual solutions to individual problems, you do have to think about the impact on the others. And that's why I think he feels that the economics and the hardship that was being brought by the depression and the impact it would have on the politics would lead us to a very bad place. And indeed it did. Yeah. And he finishes, um, he finishes the book with, with something I think is just so apt for today. These are the last two lines. To face the troubles that beset us, this apprehensive and defensive world needs now, above all, the qualities it seems for the moment to have abandoned, courage and magnanimity. And it's, it's so up to date. Um, if, if, you're, if your colleagues can get a copy, I advise them to read it. I don't see much out there that really covers the, the territory in quite the same, quite the same way. Okay, thank you. And um, just for uh, others that may wish to get in touch with you or, or follow some of your other uh, talks and writing, what's the best, best place to do that? Oh, just go to my website, which is uh, williamwhite.ca. .ca. And the CA stands for Canada. All right, well, Dr. White, thank you so much. That was, that was really, really great. My pleasure to talk to you again. Bye-bye.